Hi everyone, it's Heather Darnall. Welcome back to my art ministry channel. Thank you for being here. Today's painting and our inspiration comes from this really beautiful Easter card that my stepmom sent me well into the Easter season that I'm very well aware that has come and gone already. Um, but I'm not going to let the time of year dictate what I'm going to paint and or not paint. You know what I mean? Um, you might have heard the expression, today is a good day to have a good day. Yeah, any day. Every day is a good day or a good opportunity to make it a good day by our choice. And so it is by my choice that I am not letting the time of year dictate what I want to paint. Um, so regardless if it's an Easter card or not, it's just something that was on my heart that I wanted to do today. And so I want to share my opportunity and experience with you. Um, but I do want to say up front that it is not going to be a video where I am going to provide uh, some sort of guidance and or direction of what I'm painting um, in the process. Rather, this is going to be just a straight up worship video, meaning that I'm going to be silent on my part and only have worship music playing in the background, which will be the same music that basically I'm listening to so that in reality, we'll be listening and worshiping at the same time as the painting is coming to life. And so I hope you enjoy the process. But before we get started, today's ministry snack comes from the book of Hebrews. Chapter 12, verse 2, and it reads, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, here we go. Now, the authorship of the book of Hebrews is unknown. However, many scholars believe it was written by either Barnabas, Clement, Luke, Apollos, or the Apostle Paul, but it seems more votes, so to speak, are for Paul. Having read many books myself that Paul wrote, this style definitely seems consistent with his, and so it's no wonder why so many people, not just scholars, but everyday readers believe it is indeed him, including me. I think at this point, the only wonder is that if it was in fact Paul, why didn't he claim authorship like he did with all the other epistles? Or whoever it was, why did they choose to remain anonymous? You know, oh well, it's no matter to waste time over, but instead we need to be grateful for these God-inspired words because this epistle is very rich, very deep, very moving, and unpacks a lot of information filled with the high priesthood of Jesus, exhortations, warnings, encouragement, faith versus unbelief, and spiritual endurance to name a few. My study Bible describes it as best understood as a sermonic letter, and I'd have to say I agree. And of course, before I go any further, this is just a friendly reminder that all of what I'm sharing with you is given to you with the best of my current knowledge and understanding regarding the text. So leading up to the given scripture, I'm just going to say that the author really hammers home the subject of faith in chapter 11. He name drops a lot of people who lived by faith, not to be mistaken by works, which is a message for another time, but only noted or emphasized really so that works are not to be confused with having faith. Real quick, what I mean by that is, it is wrong for a person to think, well, it's sad and unfortunate too, for a person to think that having a checklist to go through or a laundry list of duties to fulfill before their time is up, in addition to being a nice person, is what's ultimately going to get them into heaven. We simply can't earn our heavenly citizenship. There is no amount and or types of works that we can do to make it through the pearly gate, so to speak. And being nice doesn't cut it either. I know countless over-the-top, kind, super sweet atheists, but in the end, their kindness and sweetness is all for naught. Listen to what Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 23 through 28. And this is just a drop in the bucket as far as notations, reiterating that it's all about faith and not works, as it says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely, listen to this, by his grace. So right there should tell you not by works. And it continues to say, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. He continues to say, where is the boasting then? I love this. Paul's asking, where's one's bragging rights then, so to speak? What's to beat your chest about? What's to toot your own horn on? So where's the boasting then, he's asking? Again, listen up. It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. All that said, we should also know we sure as heck don't deserve to go to heaven either because 
all of us wear filthy rags of sin. Just like Paul said, we all fall short. We are all sinners, which only leaves having faith that will justify us before God. Jesus said the gate to heaven is narrow, meaning exactly what he says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty narrow. If it wasn't narrow, then anyone could just check off their duties and works list and be A-OK. Good to go type thing boasting along the way. Therefore, faith would be void. It would be meaningless. We'd be foundationless. And so our obedience to God fulfilling God's will reveals our faith. Remember, it's all about thy will be done, not my will be done. Don't forget the difference between faith and feelings either. Feelings sway and change, whereas having faith is steadfast. It's unchangeable. We stand firm in it regardless of our circumstances. And so like I was saying, the author is just going through this giant list of names throughout the Old Testament who happened to set the bar crazy high of demonstrating their love, obedience, and faith in God the Father. These individuals waited their whole lives for Jesus and died in faith. He was promised to them, yet they never saw him. And regardless of not living during his time, they still remained faithful in believing in him. Now, just because these faithful servants didn't meet Jesus in the flesh or live during his time, doesn't mean they were lied to. It doesn't mean God had a a whoopsie moment or that they were duped. When God says he's going to do something, he's absolutely going to do that thing. No one knows when he's going to do that thing or how except for him. Why? Because it's done on his timing. Hence them having faith, believing that it's going to happen in their lifetime or not. The perk would be in their lifetime, but all they cared about was the fact that it was promised, period. The bottom line is that it takes someone being born to ultimately have a promise carried out. It doesn't matter which generation it's delivered. The fact that it was delivered at all is what's important. The Bible speaks of through Abraham's seed would it be promised, and not just to Abraham or his offspring just because they are of Abraham. For the book of Romans chapter 4 verses 2 through 3 says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 13 elaborates even more and says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Something to think about, many of us, myself included, need to take a step back and remember that Jesus hears all prayers, even the so-called prayers that we say that are actually and unfortunately self-serving. He hears all. He knows all. He knows what we're going to say before we even think about asking or praying about it, obviously because he's omniscient. And so if you're struggling with prayer and or God's promises to us, hopefully you heard a recent message of mine when I did a piece called Find Wine. You remember that message was all about prayer and how we get confused with how God answers or what he answers to, which I'll include the link in the description. If you didn't hear it and want to hear more, I've got you covered. At least I hope what I provide helps. But anyway, something else in regards to prayer and our promises that many of us don't consider is what I just touched on, which is God's timing. It was not God's timing for Jesus to come when these people lived their lives waiting and waiting for him. So don't forget what we pray for or what may have been promised to us in addition to our heavenly citizenship, provided we have faith. But the other promises like the rapture, like Christ's return, like a new heaven and earth as a few examples, may not happen in our lives either. But maybe in our kids' lives, who knows? No one knows the day or the hour of the rapture that will start that whole process. Only that it will come like a thief in the night. But what we pray for to happen quickly or what is promised to us may make more sense to God to make happen in our kids' lives or grandkids' lives and not our own. So again, timing is key. All I got to say about that is his timing is best. And if you're too impatient, then don't expect much except unnecessary frustration, discouragement, and disappointment. The Lord speaks to the prophet Isaiah in the book of Isaiah chapter 60 verse 22 and says very clearly that I am the Lord in its time. I will hasten it. Some translations say I will do this thing swiftly or go about it quickly. But what he's saying is that when he sees that the time is right, is then will he move with a sense of urgency, as the military likes to say when they want some pep in our steps. But as you can see, that's a clear indication of the importance of being patient. Like I said, chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews is all about living in faith and those who lived and died in faith. And so it ends by saying in verses 39 and 40, and all these 
though commanded through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. So in summary of chapter 11, these individuals saw preliminary glimpses of what was specifically promised, being Jesus, and all were anticipating a greater future hope because of Jesus. The sacrifices they made while they were living were all made in faith as they looked forward to the sacrifice that God would one day make when he would send Jesus. They knew what they sacrificed in their lifetime would not and could not cover the costs or the price of their sins, which is eternal death. Hence why there's no duties to fulfill, no official sacrifices to make, because it's all worthless. Nothing apart from Jesus would be sufficient, nor to this day. Those sacrifices were basically a band-aid and simply pointed to the future of the sacrifice Jesus made, a foreshadowing of what's to come. So if we could justify our sins by ourselves with various sin offerings and such, then Jesus came for nothing and died in vain meaning the promise of his death and resurrection being that better thing to cover the cost of their sins and give them a way to eternal life would all be for nothing. So when these people eventually died and having died in faith, they didn't get to enter into the kingdom of heaven right away. Again, they didn't get what was promised to them. They had to wait. Jesus had still not come yet to get them. Their souls were stuck in a compartment in the lower parts of the earth, also known as hell, awaiting to be set free. Now, I know so many people may be asking, wait, 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 wait. Why would these people who were so awesome and faithful go to hell? That's, that's just messed up. Well, hell is another message for another time, but it does have different sections or levels, if you will. And so anyone that died before Jesus could not enter into heaven, not yet. They were left to wait in the upper portion of hell, waiting to receive their promise that greater hope, which of course is Jesus. Now, these Old Testament saints weren't being tormented or anything being in hell, but they weren't exactly thrilled to be there either. But since Jesus has come and gone as promised, that holding area no longer exists or is no longer used as a holding area, not in that way anyway, being more of a transient kind of space. At least that's my understanding. The worst part of it is when Satan is finally put away for good, where he goes into the lake of fire along with all of his followers, meaning anyone and everyone who chooses to rebel against God and live their own lives instead according to their own will. I'll leave it at that because like I said, hell is a message for another time. But yeah, it's, it, it's no joke, no matter the compartment. Jesus is the door or the way to heaven, aka that narrow gate. And so the way it went down was when Jesus died, before he ascended, he had to descend into hell to set the captives free. Those three days Jesus' body was in the grave physically, he wasn't just laying there lifeless. He was actually spiritually down in the bottomless pit, ministering and preaching to his faithful servants who were imprisoned and all being comforted by Abraham as they patiently waited for Jesus' arrival to finally set them free. Put it this way, Jesus had to basically go collect his belongings and take them back up with him. So again, they knew that God had provided something better, a better plan and a better way for their spiritual destiny. Okay, finally on to the passage breakdown and or remix. Now, even though verse one was not included into the given scripture, I'm going to include it anyway, because of course it makes sense to know the before and after to have an overall clearer picture. But verse one says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, here's where I can see many people assuming that being surrounded by witnesses is being surrounded by people, meaning the saints talked about in chapter 11 as watching them, witnessing their every move they make or every move we make, and then documenting it or something. And let me just say, this is not like the classic song, Every Breath You Take, and how the lyrics say, Every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. Now that's an awesome song. And now that I'm talking about it, I think I'm going to listen to that later. Um, but I'm talking about the original album, The Police, back in the 1980s, sung by Sting, not the remix junk. But anyway, yeah, that's not what's being spoken of here. Rather, what is meant is being spiritually surrounded by those who are God's witnesses, specifically those Old Testament saints, but also includes you and me as believers too. And what I mean is how you and I want to live according to God's will and desires and having faith in Him is basically witnessing to others or showing others our way of life and our relationship with Jesus, as did the saints. 
Remember how I said earlier that our obedience to God reveals our faith. So it's not always necessarily declaring our faith verbally to others, rather showing our faith, demonstrating our faith, our obedience. I love how Pastor Chuck Smith, who has unfortunately passed on, says it as, quote, their life of faith, being those Old Testament saints, and their accomplishments through faith are a witness to us of what faith can do when we exercise faith in our own lives. Their lives witness to us on the value of walking with God, end quote. So talk about wonderful examples to keep in mind. And here's where you could also replace the word witness with demonstrate, if that helps you digest this better. Shoot, you can even think of the term show and tell. Now, I can't help but to think of this pretty corny example in regards to show and tell, but I remember having that opportunity in early grade school, maybe for you too, you know, where you would bring something to class, something important of yours, something valuable of yours, and show the class and tell them all about it so that they would learn more about it too and perhaps appreciate it as much as you do. So as you can see, living a faithful life is not just professing it with your tongue because it's a show and tell case or scenario. Well, our faith is important to us. It's valuable to us. And we want to share it with the hopes that other people will learn and appreciate the value of having faith as well. And I find it sad that so many people only verbally profess their faith and calling themselves Christians, but do absolutely nothing to back it up. They're not showing us or telling us anything about it, convincing us or anyone else that it's worth anything. And that is a fine example of what unfortunately makes true Christians look pitiful. It follows on with an exhortation to lay aside every weight, which is basically saying to leave behind the baggage and burdens of sin. And sin is always clinging, always desiring to devour us, especially sin that we're most exposed to due to habits, age, and or circumstances. Just think of the word habits as us continuously committing sin. We do it so often without even thinking about it. That's not just a habit, but a comfort. We're actually quite comfortable doing it. We're so comfortable that it's become a favorite sin, whatever it may be. Isn't it a shame that how we're willing to give up or be more aware of certain types of sin? But when it comes to our habits, our comforts, our favorite sins, yeah, we well, admit it, we get all bent out of shape and huff and puff. Now that I say that, all I can think about is baby Jack-Jack from the movie Incredibles um, when he just turns into a monster and then a ball of flames when he doesn't get his way. Well, I can't help but to think of how we act the same when we are inconvenienced or don't want to do something we know we ought to do or ought not to do. It's a good thing my son is very familiar with the book of James, particularly chapter 4, verse 17, where it says, If anyone knows the good, they ought to do it. And if it doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So, yeah, you should probably write that down. But before I move on, I must say and take note that through the sin of Adam and Eve, we are now born with a sinful nature. That's bad enough. But when sin itself becomes second nature in our lives, which is completely different, as though we don't even care to exercise any awareness of our sin, that's dangerous. Now, we may feel like whatever we do is harmless and or even not even sin at all and continue on like, you know, whatever, it's not hurting anyone or I'm my own boss anyway. But think about what I just touched on as being a witness. Collectively, we can be a cloud of witnesses through faith or we can be a cloud of false witnesses through second nature sin, which has a nasty price that ultimately puts anyone with that whatever, whatever mindset in the lake of fire. Now, just because one isn't physically shaking their fist up at the Lord doesn't mean they're not rebelling against him. Our thoughts, words, and actions that don't reflect his when we willfully don't exercise awareness is technically living a rebellious life against him. The enemy wants us to think otherwise, hence the continuous distractions keeping us away from God or watering down sin, normalizing anything and everything, convincing us that it's not harming anyone. But anyway, that's all just food for thought. So we must put aside all the sinful junk clinging on and or near, living in faith and continue to run our Christian race, enduring till the end. Now, let's stop and think about those words, race and endurance. Have any of you guys ever run a race? I have. I've run two half marathons and a 10K. Get this, all within 10 days too. But as you know, running is a demanding sport. It puts our bodies through a lot. We jeopardize our lungs, our joints, our muscular and nervous systems, and, and more. And like I said, it's demanding. It's definitely something we don't just do like Forrest Gump, you know, and one day get up and say, I, I just felt like running. And somehow come up with endless endurance and have a total sense of physical ease on our bodies like he magically did. No, 
We practice it. We stay at it. We keep on going. We're even mindful of what we eat and how we sleep to help ensure that we can keep on going. Well, running a Christian race is also hard. It also requires practice, awareness, and endurance. And in all that, we stumble. We need rest and recovery. We come across painful experiences. The bottom line is a lot is required of us, but we keep our eye on the prize being an heir to the kingdom of heaven. Check this out, listen up. God isn't handing out placement trophies and ribbons. Rather, he's handing out something better, which are his praises and permission to enter. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 25, verse 23 says, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of our Lord. So keep in mind those difficulties in our Christian life or race, however you want to see it as, are dearly noted how we respond to them. Never lose sight of the grand prize. The world wants trophies and ribbons, things that will perish. But like I said, the Lord offers his praises, which is everlasting. So don't give up that race as a Christian. The Bible never says it's going to be easy. It does say the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. All right, now onto the given scripture. So verse two is basically a continuation of verse one, sharing the same sentence. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So if you recall, the author was reminding us about being surrounded by, or some translations may say encompassed by, a multitude or a cloud of great witnesses that were dedicated and committed to living their lives in faith to God. And he gives instruction and encouragement to put aside our sin as best as humanly possible so that we can continue to run our Christian race. We are to run with endurance and patience that is set before us by the power of the Holy Spirit, looking to Jesus with awe and admiration, whom is our heavenly prize and the founder and perfecter of our faith. So go all out. Utilize your God-given endurance to finish the race. For when we do, we will see the fullness of God's glory manifested in Jesus. I do have to say that it is so sad that so many people are convinced otherwise that we give ourselves faith, that we are told to have faith in ourselves. Those are actually demonic influences. Now, I know a lot of you might be like, excuse me, please, demonic my butt. Isn't that a bit absurd, a little far-fetched? You guys, the devil isn't just a growler and a monster. Remember, he is disguised as an angel of the light, which means he disguises his voice or he changes his tone of voice as well as his vocabulary to water down and twist so many things, making them seem to be exactly those things, i.e. absurd. That said, as I just mentioned, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, where out of that crystal clear statement does that mean that we ourselves are the way? Where do we get out of that that we are to rely on ourselves for being the founder and perfecter of our faith and everything else? That's simply the enemy whispering twisted thoughts into our heads made to seem so innocent solely to redirect our focus onto ourselves because once we focus on ourselves, we are then set to self-destruction, especially if we're not already saved. Listen up, you guys, hear this. Living is not just verbalizing our faith, although that is important. But as we all know, in general and in faith too, actions speak louder than words. And so there's that example again of being a witness who also demonstrates their faith in action to solidify what was verbally professed. Let me put it to you this way. Satan believes in Jesus too. He knows he's real and he also knows he's more powerful than him. And so even though he believes in Jesus, it's evident that he's not living for Jesus. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all this spiritual chaos and calamity in the world. Satan lives for himself, living out his own will and desires. Therefore, he wants to get anyone and everyone to do the same. And if he can do that, then he's got us in the bag. So that is why this is extremely vital to understand that we are not the founder of our faith or the perfecter of anything only Jesus is. Speaking of being the perfecter, that doesn't mean that Jesus is going to suddenly make us perfect. Hopefully you remember what I mentioned that the Apostle Paul quoted as us all falling short, all of us being sinners. And we're all going to die sinners too, even the saved. 
but the saved are those that Jesus works in, perfecting our faith more by the day and in every way that models him. It continues to say, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, which was of course Jesus who volunteered himself to suffer horrifically for our sins, and not as a duty or a chore, but for joy as he took on God's wrath for all of our disobedience, foolishness, and filth, that being the sin of the world, but the joy of it was his joy, his joy of bringing us victory over sin. You know, as a flawed human, it's hard for me to think of that as literal, as far as him having any sort of joy in his death, but as we should all know, there is meaning to that, which is what I'm trying to lay out so that we can better understand. Now, because he was also fully man, yeah, his beatings and crucifixion were excruciating to say the least, but because he's also fully God, he was able to still have joy in his suffering for our sakes. So not only was he joyful bringing us victory, but he was also joyful to redeem us. He was joyful to forgive us. He was joyful in bringing our brokenness back to a wholesome state. He was joyful in sparing us from a horrifying eternal death. That is also why I believe that when we are suffering, when we are in pain, we too can still find joy because our sufferings cannot compare and our sufferings are temporary. Like I said earlier, the Bible didn't say life was going to be a cakewalk. It said that he will never leave us or forsake us. And you will find the Gospels riddled with promises of his comfort and peace when we are at our wit's end. And the verse finishes off by saying, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, just because he had joy in it all, he also despised it. He despised what was to come. The nakedness in public, the floggings, the beatings, the ripping of his hair out, the, the being spit on, the demand of him to carry his own massive cross in which he had no strength to carry, the razor sharp thorns being gouged into his head, and then after all that to be nailed into the hands and in the feet. Like I said, he had human emotions about that. He did not want to go through it because of the shame, because of the pain. He was praying in the garden to the Father that if it were all possible, to pass this cup from me. But if it is your will, then I have joy in your will. And because he endured the race, because he had joy, because he lived for the will of the Father, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. That said, when we endure the race, when we have joy in all circumstances, when we live for Jesus and not just casually claiming our faith in Jesus, but outright living boldly in our faith, we too, like Jesus said in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. All right. Wow. I know that was a lot to take in, but hopefully it was insightful. And so now let's get started. got nothing new how could i express all my gratitude i could sing these songs as i often do but every song must end God won't respond. I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again. Feel 
Generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name.
Be magnified. 
a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the Throw 